It's time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour. Brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Larry LeSeur and Kenneth Crawford, National Affairs Editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Frank C. Osmers, United States Representative from New Jersey. No war has ever been so well publicized as the possible conflict between this country and Red China over those little islands called Kimoi and Matsu off the China mainland. And such are the conflicting estimates of enemy capabilities that we don't know whether the war will ever start or indeed whether the guns have opened up while we're doing this very broadcast. Representative Osmers, as a veteran of World War II and a member of the House Armed Services Committee, just what would happen if we were engaged in a conflict over those islands? Is our army capable of handling it and winning it? Well, I don't believe, uh, Larry, that if we became involved in any situation involving the Chinese mainland, I don't believe that our army as such, our ground forces, would invade the mainland of China, that it would be primarily a naval and air force action. Do you believe that we would bomb the mainland of China? It uh, certainly is my belief that we would bomb the uh, uh, tactical air bases which were being used uh, to attack our forces in that area. With A-bombs? Uh, I would say from what the President said the other day that we would use the small uh, nuclear weapon for that purpose. Well, uh, Representative Osmers, if we use these uh, tiny A-bombs on the heads of our Chinese adversaries, isn't there a possibility we might bring some very big ones down on our own heads through Russia's alliance with them? There is always that possibility that if we, uh, if we fight fire with fire, we may have fire used uh, back against us. That is true. Well, what about our alliance potential in India and uh, Indonesia, countries with tremendous populations? Uh, the very fact that we had used uh, nuclear weapons against Asiatics for the second time might uh, lose us these friends forever. I believe that our great danger in the Orient does not stem from uh, the type of weapon that we might use in a given situation. Our great danger there, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, lies in the possibility that we would not be decisive in our actions and that we would therefore lose face as we have already done in several situations. Mr. Mr. Yes. Excuse me. Mr. Osmers, uh, what is your judgment about what will happen there? Uh, there seems to be some <coughs> doubt as to whether this attack actually will take place or not. Well, Mr. Crawford, I think that there will be a great deal of backing and filling, uh, but uh, no actual hostilities in the accepted sense until the Big Four Conference is, and the Bandung Conference and so on are held, that uh, it will be used as a talking point and probably be brought before the Big Four Conference as one of the items upon which we might uh, uh, negotiate with the Reds. Well, Congressman Osmer, as if... Uh as you say, it doesn't seem uh, strategically possible that we would employ the United States Army on the mainland of Asia, especially from those ports of Amoy and Fu Chao, that since there's no strategic point directly behind them, why indeed would we use the uh, nuclear weapons if uh, there were nothing to be gained by it? Well, I am assuming that, uh, that we accept the government's policy to defend uh, Formosa and the Pescadori Islands. And if we do make that assumption, it then would be assumed that we would use our nuclear weapons against the mainland of Red China for the purpose of preventing them from, from uh, taking the objective which we have sworn to defend, so that we would be uh, assuming an aggressive defensive attitude in connection with knocking out those installations. Well, Mr. Osmers, is it not possible that the nationalist Chinese will be able themselves to defend those islands, so the question of our intervention may not arise? Well, I don't believe that, the, wh while I do have confidence that the nationalist Chinese, in a ground force sense, in an infantry sense, would be able to defend the islands against any normal type of, uh, of overwater operation. The uh, uh, Chinese Reds do not have, as I can uh, learn, the type of uh, marine uh, uh, support that they would need to cross that water unless they had complete air superiority and naval superiority, and I feel sure that our forces in both of those fields there are superior to theirs. Well, uh, Representative Osmers, it seems to me that uh, in World War II, which we all remember, and, and indeed in which you took a part in the Pacific, 
that we warned the Japanese against moving against British Singapore or against the Dutch Indies, not only moved against them both, but hit us at the same time. What is there to prevent or to make one think that this action against the, uh, the, the Formosa and or against the Kamoi and Matsu would be an isolated action? They might hit in Korea, in Indochina, and in that direction at the same time. Or would our army be capable of handling it? I would say that our army, at the, our ground forces at the present time, would not be capable of uh, handling an operation such as you've outlined, where they had a three-pronged ground force attack. We would not presently have the ground forces that could do that, and we would have to do exactly what we did in the situation that you referred to. We would have to suffer initial losses and then go back uh, uh, as we did in World War II. Well, as a veteran and a Republican, then why have we cut back the Army to the extent we have, 140,000 men, if we're not capable of handling any of the missions which the Army is called upon to perform? Well, I suppose that no matter what Army figures should be decided on, whether it is the 2,850,000 that has been proposed by the administration or whether it was any other figure from 1 to 10 million, that there would be agreement that that was the proper size of the Army. I, this figure of 2,850,000, roughly a million men in the Army, a million in the Air Force, and 850,000 in the Navy and Marines, is the result of the estimate of the Department of Defense as to the Army that we will need and can support during the period of uneasy peace that uh, we seem to be in at this time. Now, is this new reserve plan of yours uh, going to build up the Army and beef it up, or is it, uh, is it like universal military training? The reserve plan will have little or no effect on the active forces of the Army. The main change that will be made under the new reserve plan is to provide an additional category of training and of providing for a reserve. At the moment, we have a nominal reserve of nearly three million. However, of the three million, we have but 700,000 of them, including the National Guard, in an active uh, status. And the proposal is to take uh, volunteers, a minimum of 100,000 and a maximum of 250,000 at any one time, train them for six months, and then give them after that eight, uh, seven and a half years of reserve training, which they can work out in either 48 drills and two weeks of camp, or in 30 days of active duty, or if they fail to do that, the bill provides that they may be ordered to 45 days of active duty. If they fail to honor that call, they would then become subject to military justice. Mr. Osmers, this falls far short of universal military training, does it not? Well, it falls completely short of universal military training. Uh, in first place, it is not universal. It is volunteer in, in providing the, uh, the, the forces that go into it. Uh, we now produce a class each year of young men, approximately 1,100,000. We need approximately 700,000 men each year to keep our armed forces at the level uh, that uh, with the uh, regiments and the uh, 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 failure to re-enlist and the end of draft terms. We need 700,000 men and we will only use at a maximum of 250,000. So there will still be some young men who will not receive any call at all under the proposed program. Congressman Osmers, the uh, World Board of the Methodist Church is dead against any form of, of military training which in any way resembles universal military training. What assurances have you that uh, your reserve plan is ever going to pass against that sort of opposition? Well, I would say that the reserve plan has an excellent uh, chance of passage because it is not universal military training. If it were universal military, military training, I think it would have a very hard uh, job of getting through. But it is not, in fact, universal military training. And many church groups have opposed the use of compulsion uh, for religious, uh, on religious grounds. Uh, we have a number of people in this country who are uh, honestly pacifists, such as the Quakers, and who uh, object to the uh, carrying of arms, and uh, those groups, of course, object to any type of compulsion at all. Well, may I ask, uh, Congressman Osmers, what exactly are the differences between your plan of training reservists and universal military training? Well, universal military training, in its classical accepted sense, would mean that at some age in a young man's life, let us say 18 years of age, every young man in the country who was physically fit 
would be called up for a stated period of military duty. Every young man, regardless of his background, his education, his situation in life, as opposed to that, we now use a selective service basis. Now, we do not need a million one hundred thousand each year now so that uh, uh, we don't need universal military training. Well, already there have been complaints. We haven't got enough engineers in this country to uh, run our technical machine. Is your plan going to take care of screening out people of such talents so that we can have a technical army such as you forecast in a war against uh, China? The selective, service, uh, the selective service system, of course, takes that into account to a considerable degree now, and that will continue to be so. In connection with the new program, of the six-month uh, enlistee with seven and a half years of reserve duty uh, uh, subsequent to that, you have young men who have not yet attained the uh, scientific skills. I have introduced a bill, which of course we are not discussing here tonight, which would provide for a system of defense scholarships for uh, scientific students and would exempt them from uh, normal military duty and would provide them with scientific education uh, at uh, the cost of the government, we provide for at least a thousand of them each year. That sounds like a good idea. Thank you very much, Representative Frank Osmers of New Jersey. The opinions expressed on the Longine Chronoscope were those of the speakers. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Larry Lasseur and Kenneth Crawford. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Frank C. Osmers, United States Representative from New Jersey. If you ever buy an automatic, that is, a self-winding watch, please bear in mind that an automatic is even more complicated than a hand-wound watch. And for that reason, it'll pay you to make sure that the automatic watch you select bears the name Longines, because Longines makes the world's most advanced automatic watches. Now, here are the facts. An automatic watch is wound by a tiny pendulum called a rotor, which swings back and forth with the motions of your wrist. Now, this diagram represents the winding rotor of an ordinary automatic. See how it moves only in half a circle. And this diagram represents the Longines automatic. Every Longines automatic watch contains the 360 degree full swing winding rotor, a development pioneered by Longines engineers. Full swing motion means highest winding efficiency without winding shock for the Longine motor moves freely in a full circle in either direction, and every movement provides winding action. More important, however, is the fact that Longine watches are made to the highest standards in all watchmaking, standards which have won for Longine 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, more honors for accuracy than any other timepiece. Longine watches for ladies and gentlemen are made in a variety of styles, in stainless steel, gold-filled, and 14-karat gold cases. So that if you pay $71.50 or more for a watch, for your own protection, insist on a Longines, the world's most honored watch, the world's most honored gift, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world's honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.